In the early morning hours of June 17, 2013, a teenage boy woke up and decided to go for a jog around his local suburb about 40 miles outside of Boston. It's an area that is a stone's throw from beautiful, stately, and expensive homes. One mansion is even owned by a football superstar, Patriots tied in Aaron Hernandez. As the boy continued his run near an industrial park, it was much like any morning. Until it wasn't. When the boy stumbles upon a dead body. The man is lying face up. His eyes are vacant. He's been shot. Multiple times. Horrified and not knowing what to do, the boy runs to a nearby business and shop owners immediately contact police. An investigation begins. The dead man is identified as Odin Lloyd, a well-liked semi-pro football player, a local town hero of sorts who everyone seemed to love. Those who knew him were shocked. Who could have done such a thing? The main suspect would soon be revealed. And it wasn't your average criminal. No, it was a man celebrated for his Herculean feats, feats on the football field. It was the man who lived close by and a man who was connected to the victim. It was Aaron Hernandez. The Aaron Hernandez, who was the young New England Patriots star known to the world. But Aaron Hernandez, the murderer, well, he was not so known. At least not yet. It would soon be revealed that no one knew the true Aaron. No one knew the real Aaron Hernandez. You see, Aaron Hernandez was a man of secrets. Behind that charming, confident grin and picture-perfect facade, Behind the money, behind the mansion, behind his beautiful fiancée and his baby daughter, and behind his power on the football field, he hid a secret identity. An identity that he was determined to guard at all cost. It's often said that the truth is stranger than fiction. Maybe that's why to this day, years later, The story of Aaron Hernandez continues to transfix sports fans and true crime aficionados alike. I first covered this case in 2017, and I was the first one to interview Aaron's fiance, Shayna Jenkins, about the murder of Odin Lloyd. Shayna was Aaron's high school sweetheart, but her conversation to me offered just one piece of the puzzle that made up the very complex Aaron Hernandez. I want to talk about what she said and give you the behind the scenes insight on what she revealed about her relationship with Aaron. Cases like this are important for us to look into because they beg the question how well do you really know someone? And why do people do the things they do? I've made no secret of the fact that I am fascinated by why people do what they do and don't do what they don't do. This is a perfect example of why I'm fascinated with that question. Why would someone that for all intent and purposes has the world by the tail be involved in this kind of secret life? There's no question that America loves an underdog and a rags-to-riches story, but America also has a fascination with watching someone on top take a long, hard fall. We're about to find out what made Aaron tick. Why, despite all his blessings, was he willing to risk it all? Why was he drawn to a lifestyle of crime despite his talents and his great success? You're listening to Episode 1 of The Fall of a Hero, From Football to Murder, The Aaron Hernandez Story, Mystery and Murder, Analysis by Dr. Phil. I am Dr. Phil. Phil. 
Green Chef is the first USDA certified organic meal kit company. Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from. Love switching it up? Now you can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. Choosing Green Chef means choosing real foods that support a healthy lifestyle. You can count on meals that are good for your body. Green Chef offers unique farm fresh ingredients and premium proteins. The beef tenderloin with tomato shallot sauce. Now this is a restaurant-worthy meal that's guaranteed to wow. The paleo-friendly meal is fantastic and simple to make. Robin and I have fun creating Green Chef meals. It fits perfectly with our diet and lifestyle. So go to greenchef.com slash 60mystery and use code 60mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's greenchef.com slash 60mystery and use code 60mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. The number one meal kit for eating well. Now, when you hear about this story, of course, it's Aaron this, Aaron that. But let's look back to the scene of the crime. We can't forget the true victim in this case, Odin Lloyd. He was only 27 years old when he died. His corpse was riddled with bullets. His body had been left in a secluded area. According to first responders to the scene, the hit, well, it seemed personal. In total, he appeared to have six gunshot wounds to his back and side. With a rainstorm fast approaching, officers had to move quickly to preserve what was clearly a crime scene. After securing the scene with tarp and tents to protect his body from the elements, they took stock of what the clues near Odin could tell them about his death. Now here's what they found. Five casings from a 45 caliber gun were found near Lloyd's body. A white towel on the ground, a half-smoked blunt. Now, let's think about this for a minute. A 45 caliber gun. We're talking about a hand can in here. Police usually carry a 38. This is a larger caliber gun. That's what I mean when I say a hand can. And a half-smoked marijuana cigarette and a white towel. It was a ghastly scene. Odin left behind a devastated mother, sister, and girlfriend, Shania Jenkins. Before long, investigators would realize the significance of that name. One of the most important pieces of evidence that detectives found on Odin was a set of keys to Enterprise Rent-A-Car. When they took those keys to Enterprise, it turns out the car was rented to none other than Aaron Hernandez. A set of keys to an Enterprise rent car Police were baffled. The officer on the phone was shocked to hear that right there on the rental contract it said New England Patriots. The same Aaron Hernandez he cheered on Sundays might now be connected to a murdered man. What was going on? This just doesn't happen every day. From the start, this seemed unfathomable. It was like saying a snowball had a chance in hell. This just doesn't happen. Why would an NFL football player be connected with a case like this? And how would he be connected? Well, Odin's girlfriend, Shania Jenkins, just happened to be the sister of Cheyenne Jenkins. Aaron Hernandez's fiance. Police had no choice. They had to follow the evidence to the letter. First up was who was with Odin that night. His text messages proved to be very revealing. It seemed that one of the last people to see Odin alive had been Aaron, the night before he was found dead. On that fateful night, Aaron and two of his pals picked up Odin from his home around 2.30 a.m. Now, right away, you've got to think. Here's an NFL star. What's he doing out at 2.30 a.m. in the morning picking up someone? My mama used to tell me 
I don't know what's happening at 2.30 in the morning, but it ain't good. When police examined the text messages of Odin's phone, it seemed like he was concerned for his safety. He texted his sister, and I quote, Did you see who I'm with? And then clarified, quote, NFL. The last message that Odin would ever send read, quote, just so you know. The texts were vague, but it seemed to investigators like there was a veiled message here. He was almost texting in code. He wanted his sister to know who he was with. Did he fear he might come to harm that night and want to give his family the information they needed if something bad happened to him? Or was he just bragging about who he was hanging out with? And if he was tipping them off in case something bad happened, what was it that was making Odin nervous? He knew Aaron. They were romantically involved with sisters and most likely would be brother-in-law someday. Why on earth would he fear him? They had this connection. I mean, think about it. The way things were going, these two would be having Thanksgiving dinner together. These two would be having children that would play together one day. It was a puzzle, and police were eager to find out. A day later, they were inside Aaron's impressive $1.3 million North Attleboro Mansion, combing through and looking for evidence. From the beginning of the investigation, Aaron's demeanor was arrogant. Police and news reporters made him out to be unbothered by the loss of his alleged good friend. From the very first time police went to question Aaron, he didn't make much effort to make himself appear innocent. What was it about him that he had an attitude that seemed adversarial towards police from day one, minute one? When police first approached Aaron's house, they could see lights and the TV on, but no one came to the door. Only after about 45 minutes of police lingering outside his house did Aaron decide to come and speak to them. Now, keep in mind, at this point, the police don't know that Aaron is connected to the murder. They're actually concerned about him because they found the keys to his rental car in a dead man's pocket. For all they know, he could be the victim of foul play as well. Why would a dead man have Aaron Hernandez's rental car keys in his pocket? Well, they asked him the same question. Aaron stated he had rented the car for his boy Odin. Here's where things get telling. Officers told Aaron they were investigating a murder. They didn't specify that it was Odin's murder. But what was strange was that Aaron never asked. No what, no why, no how, no curiosity. Now, I've worked with law enforcement a lot. I've talked to investigators a lot. And let me assure you, when you go talk to someone and tell them you're investigating a murder... The first normal, the first natural response from an interviewee is, who died? Who we talking about here? To not ask? Well, that's bizarre. One reason you wouldn't ask is if you already know. If the police come to your door and ask about a murder, it's safe to say, you're going to ask who was murdered. And if you don't ask, it's going to raise suspicion with the police. They're certainly going to write in their notepad, you didn't ask, and they're going to start considering the reasons why. 
Instead of seeming curious or alarmed, it struck officers as curious that he seemed downright annoyed and angered by their intrusion. How dare they come bother him? And how dare they lurk outside his house for 45 minutes? He even asked, and I quote, What's with all the questions? My fiancé's sister's boyfriend is dead. And he says, what's with all the questions? Not to be confused with, oh my God, how can I help? Oh my God, I was with him just last night. No, no. His response was, what's with all the questions? And when I say arrogant, he didn't seem nervous either. He didn't seem scared. Not one bit. In fact, he slipped officers his lawyer's card, shut the door in their faces, and locked the door. Obviously, this whole interaction was causing alarm bells to go off at full volume for police. The NFL star they once thought might be in danger was quickly becoming a suspect. Now, in cases where police are investigating celebrities or well-known figures, the pressure is heightened because of public scrutiny. Now, I'm not saying that they apply a different standard with them than they do others, a different standard of evidence, a different standard of investigation, a different standard of proof before they take action. What I'm saying is they know that unlike some unknown suspect that nobody's going to pay attention to, nobody's going to get the file and read the interview, read their notes, they know everybody up and down the chain of command is going to look at their notes on this case. They're going to view body cams. They're going to read case files and see if they did everything they were supposed to do So they're going to have to cross the T's and dot the I's. Whether it's O.J. Simpson, Ted Kennedy in the case of Mary Jo Kopechny, or the recent case of Operation Varsity Blues involving college money fraud, all eyeballs are going to be on a high-profile case, and that means the investigators are under pressure. Now, in this case, police knew they had to move quickly. You always hear, first 48 hours. That's actually true because it's during that time when evidence is fresh, the trail is fresh. And after that, people start to disappear, cover their tracks, evidence begins to decay. You need to move quickly in these cases. And they had to build a case that had legs to stand on when it was challenged and scrutinized. Now, keep in mind, reporters were staking out Aaron, his family, and his house. This was major news. In this part of the country, and you're talking New England Patriots, you're talking headline news. And he was not some backup. He was not some practice squad player. He was a star. We're talking about an NFL player who plays for a dynasty. All of a sudden, he is a suspect in a heinous crime. This doesn't happen every day. Now, clearly, Professional athletes, college athletes, they they get in scrapes, they get in problems with drinking or staying out past curfew, and they get suspended. You hear this and that. But we're talking about murder here. This is a whole different level of problem. It's bound to make journalists eager to get the story out there for public consumption. Now, as I said, he just said, what's with all the questions? handed them his lawyer's card as though he keeps a pocket full, and closed the door in her face. Well, they took that as a cue, and sure enough, they reached out to his lawyers. They brought Aaron in for questioning. They still weren't showing their full hand. Video surveillance plays a huge role in this case. This is one of the first examples of police using video to beat a suspect at his own game. That was the case with Aaron. Aaron's lawyers pulled into the police station, parking his vehicle right in view of the station's surveillance system. Then, right there on camera, right there on the security cameras of the police station, 
officers were able to see Aaron do something, well, strange. He got into the passenger seat, illuminated by the light of the open door, then right there, plain as day, he disassembled his BlackBerry. He just took it apart. Now, of course, this looks like a bright red flag to police. Is he destroying evidence? What is on this device that he doesn't want anyone to see? Now, talk about arrogance. You're going to destroy a communication device, so you pull into the police parking lot, get out of your car, walk around, get into the passenger seat, apparently to get into the glove compartment, I guess, I don't know, open the door so the dome light comes on, and sit right there and destroy the device. Soon after, Aaron's lawyer informed police that the interrogation with his client was over. Police then decided to pull a fast one. They asked Aaron to turn over his phone, knowing full well that he had just destroyed that very device. The lawyer refused to turn it over and did not elaborate. As days wore on, Aaron didn't seem to be doing much to turn police towards other suspects. The evidence was building into one undeniable conclusion. Aaron Hernandez was involved. It wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of how. And it was a matter of why. The world was about to witness one of the biggest falls from grace of our generation or any recent generation. Within four days of the discovery of Odin's body, police didn't just have a hunch he had been with Aaron before his death. They confirmed it. They knew it for sure. Video surveillance emerged showing that Aaron and Odin were in fact together on that fateful night. Police found footage of that rented Nissan pulling into that industrial park where Odin's body would soon be found. Once police had that video, they were able to obtain a warrant to search the Hernandez mansion. Again, it was interesting for investigators to note Aaron's calm demeanor during all this. He was sitting on his couch, playing with his daughter, watching TV. Was it nerves of steel? A poker face? Or just bravado? Because you heard what I said, they didn't just have video of Hernandez with Odin. They had it on the night of his death. And they didn't just have him driving down the street somewhere. They had him pulling into the industrial park where Odin's body was found Dead, shot with a 45. The walls were closing in. What was going to happen? Why would this professional athlete in a position most people only dream about? Why would he risk it all to commit a murder? What could this person know? What could this person have said? What could this person have done? Why could this person be so significant, so important, that Aaron Hernandez would risk everything he had worked so hard to achieve to make this person dead? Well, it was a case that just seemed to defy logic, and yet the case was becoming all the more clear. Think back to O.J.'s infamous white Bronco chase, the low-speed chase on the freeways in L.A. Now, helicopters and news vans trailed Aaron's every move as he drove his white sport utility vehicle to Gillette Stadium, then his lawyer's office. He gave no comment when he stopped for gas. Apparently, Aaron had gone to Gillette Stadium in order to speak with Patriots owner Robert Kraft. Once he was there, knowing the heat was on, Robert and other Patriot higher-ups had him leave. 
If Aaron was worried about his career and life, if he was concerned that it would soon be up in flames, he wasn't outwardly showing it. He was the tough guy, cool as a cucumber. His poker face portrayed nothing. He was walking around like he was just waiting for the next thing. If police were looking for clues from Aaron, he was not tipping his hand. He was not showing them anything. Body language, nothing. Facial expression, nothing. Words, damn few. If he knew anything, he was choosing to keep it locked in the vault. But you know, that's the thing about secrets. When they involve murder, you got a lot of people pulling on strings and they just have a way of unraveling. At this point, we know police are hot on his trail. Now, before this, he had been known as a talented football player. His body covered practically from head to toe in tattoos. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. You can't judge a book by its cover just because he has tattoos all over. That doesn't necessarily mean anything, but you can't necessarily dismiss it either. Do they have a meaning? Well, the public wanted to know more. Who was Aaron Hernandez? The media was starting to assemble a picture just like they were putting together a jigsaw puzzle, and every piece that snapped in place was completing a very dark picture of Aaron Hernandez. To understand, as these pieces were snapping into place, you have to start at the beginning. Aaron was born to working-class parents in Bristol, Connecticut. His father was a janitor, and his mother was an administrative assistant. Growing up, sports were practically a religion in the Hernandez household. Aaron and his older brother DJ were both expected by their father to excel. Aaron's father, Dennis, was known as a bit of a hometown hero. He was known in the community as a former athlete. Back when he was in high school, he himself was a football star. Dennis got a scholarship to the University of Connecticut and set his sights on pursuing a professional football career. But the shooting of a police officer changed all of that. Now, while Dennis was never charged in the shooting of a police officer, the result of a botched break-in, he was suspected of possibly helping the perpetrators who were also on his football team escape or hide. His suspective involvement effectively ended his football career before it ever really started. With his one-time dream dashed, sources say this drove Dennis to want for his sons the chance at what he could never have for himself, athletic glory. And he was going to make sure they succeeded no matter what. Starting his children, Aaron and his brother worked out constantly, did drills, all under the watchful eye of their father. And he was hard on them. Make no mistake about it. According to friends who knew Aaron well, he both idolized and feared his father. His dad had very strong ideas of what, quote, a real man should be. Athletic, strong, masculine. And that had a profound impact on Aaron. There are stories that came out about Dennis' parenting methods that just blew my mind. DJ once recounted a story about his father saying that he once picked up the phone to call for help when his father was on one of his abusive tears. His father's response? According to DJ, he handed me the phone and he said, I'm going to beat you even harder, you and your brother and they're going to have to pull me off you when they knock down the door. And it wasn't just his sons who were on the receiving end of Dennis' erratic moods. Allegedly, he was a violent spouse as well. They were constantly fighting, breaking up, getting back together. They filed for bankruptcy. Through it all, Aaron's mother always took Dennis back. 
So throughout Aaron's childhood, he was witnessing and experiencing a lot of violence, a lot of turmoil. As children grow up, the adults in their world write on the slate of who they are. The anonymous poem is true. Children do learn what they live, and when they live with chaos, violence, and turmoil, it's not just an experience that they have, and when it ends, it ends. It changes who they are. It can profoundly influence their physical and mental health, their ability to control how they modulate their emotions and impulses because these people are their role models. They look to their father. These boys, DJ and Aaron, look to their father as their role model of how to handle relationships, how to handle anger, how to express their feelings. And they're very likely to go out and replicate that kind of relationship in their own romantic life. And it can create tremendous anger. Because a parent that is violent, a parent that is controlling, a parent that puts a child under their thumb, what would you call them if they weren't parents? You would call them bullies. And the bullied is often frustrated that they can't fight back, that they can't push back. So all of that anger, all of that frustration is pushed down inside until they finally get in a position of power and then it all comes bubbling out. So while they may grow up with depression and anxiety, once they get in the position of power, once they're the one in control in a relationship, once they're big enough and strong enough that they can assert their will, boy, oh boy, can they exact revenge in an unbridled fashion. And we know they are at high risk for underachievement in school. They're at high risk for criminal activity, drug use. They're at high risk for many, many things, all negative. So we know this about Aaron. We know it about his brother, but we certainly know it about Aaron. When Aaron was only 16, his father unexpectedly passed away from a routine surgery. Now, I've often said you should never let time pass without saying or doing what you feel like you need to say or do with the people that are important in your life. Now, why do I say that? Because we never know when people are going to be taken from us. We never know when we're going to be taken. And so I always say, don't let the sun set on you again without saying or doing what you need to say or do with your parents, with your children, with your spouse. You don't know if either one of us, you or me, are going to get to the end of this sentence, the end of this podcast. And sometimes people think, well, that means I need to go tell my parents that I really love them. You know, sometimes it's not love that needs to be expressed. Sometimes it's anger. Sometimes it's resentment. Sometimes it's frustration. And if that person dies before you've had the chance to tell them what you need to tell them, you can spend the rest of your life feeling cheated. I can't tell you how many people have told me they have stood in the graveyard looking down at their father saying, how dare you die on me, you son of a bitch. You cheated me. I wanted to tell you what you did to me. I wanted to tell you how you hurt me. But you died before I could. Did that happen to Aaron? He was only 16 and had been the product of his father's violence and bully behavior when his father suddenly, unexpectedly passed away from routine surgery. Was he left with a lot of unfinished emotional business. Friends noted that at the funeral, Aaron seemed to have instantly changed. He didn't cry. It was like a completely new personality had taken over. Once a jokester, he had seemingly become tough and determined overnight. Is it because he was left with this unfinished emotional business? Now, why am I digressing and talking about this? Because people often ask me, Dr. Phil, who does this kind of thing? 
Well, I'm trying to answer that question. Aaron's father was the one who challenged and inspired him, and yes, bullied and feared him. With that gone, Aaron still had football as his focus, and he didn't have a parental figure he feared anymore to keep him in line. Was he now going to hold himself to a higher standard? Maybe it caused Aaron to face his mortality. It was hard for him to face that. Maybe this super tough exterior was a way to hide those feelings. We'll dive more into this later, but just suffice it to say that the most powerful role model in any child's life is the same-sex parent, and much of Aaron's identity was wrapped up in how his father perceived him and defined him as a man. Maybe his father, pushing him the way he did, caused him to adopt a toxic definition of masculinity. Others do say this was a true turning point when Aaron was able to completely focus his energy on football. When he was a junior in high school, he caught the eye of Urban Meyer, a famous coach at the University of Florida. That is the thing about this case. Aaron may have been troubled, prone to violence, even murder. But before any of that came to light, he was a force to be reckoned with on the field. He had a talent that was undeniable. When he was invited to join the Gators as a college student, it seemed like everything was on the right track. In fact, he was instrumental in his team winning two, not one, but two national championships. He knew he was good enough to go pro. In 2010, he was drafted at just 20 years old to the Patriots. His skill made him the talk of the team. Sports journalists took note of his abilities. Sure, he didn't fit the cookie-cutter image of, say, Tom Brady, but make no mistake, they respected him. He was known for having a good work ethic. He'd often be the first to arrive and the last to leave. Things were coming together for him personally as well. Joining the Patriots meant he could reconnect with people from his past that lived fairly close. Among them, Cheyenne Jenkins. When I sat down with Cheyenne in 2017, her steadfast loyalty to Aaron struck me. It was evident that her love for him was unconditional. How long uh, had you known Aaron? Since grammar school. So grammar school? My entire life, Uh more or less. How did you guys get together as a couple, and when did that start? Well, he would say it was middle school. I'd say it's more towards high school when we actually Uh started to pursue each other. It was high school love, high school sweethearts. And what point did you get engaged? We were engaged October of um, 2012, before our daughter was born. Aaron and Cheyenne had known each other back in middle school. Cheyenne had loved Aaron before he was an NFL tight end, before he became this sports idol. Perhaps he felt safe with her. His life hadn't always been easy, but with this rekindled romance and a baby on the way, things were looking up for Aaron. But while Cheyenne was, by all accounts, a grounding influence for him, he kept her in the dark about his other extracurricular activities. He had relationships with those that were less than desirable. What do you say about that? Um, I'd say, I mean, everyone has their own choice in friends. Um, he didn't have the best choice in some friends, but that doesn't, you know, that didn't make him a bad person. As far as, you know, the relationships he had with outsiders, I don't necessarily know too much about that. I invited everyone into the home that he brought there. I was never rude. Was he a gang member? Not from my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Would you have known? Probably not, to be honest with you. That's not the Aaron that I know. Well, if she didn't know then that Aaron was involved with a questionable crowd, she was sure finding out a lot now. The media was exploding with salacious details about Aaron's past. These were stories that had been buried for years that were now suddenly coming to light, and they certainly didn't make Aaron look like a Boy Scout. Some of his most significant brushes with the law began during his time at the University of Florida. As a freshman, he went to the Swamp Bar, a local college watering hole, for a night out. 
Apparently, he had an altercation with a bar manager regarding the bill. And according to reports, he attacked this manager, resulting in blowing out his eardrum. Now, such an allegation could have really thrown a wrench in his budding career. So it was said that his coach and other higher-ups stepped in to dissuade the manager from pressing charges. You might think that he'd have this close call with trouble and then have that inspire him to stay on the straight and narrow. Not so much. In 2012, he had become an alleged person of interest in another case. During a night out at a club, it was alleged that Aaron had words with two men. These men were subsequently murdered in a drive-by shooting. A witness described someone who looked just like Aaron Hernandez. And yet, charges against him were never filed. These stories show two alarming things. That Aaron was exhibiting signs of deep anger and violent tendencies. And worse, he was seeing that he could behave as he wished and suffer no consequences. And why? Because he was a football star. He could run fast, jump high, and catch a ball. And because of that, he was being shown that he was above the law. He was above the rules. He did not have to be accountable for his actions. People would swoop in and make everything okay. He might have gotten away with drugs and crime for years, but this time, this time, he had finally pushed his luck too far. Right before Aaron was arrested in the murder of Odin Lloyd, another man came forward accusing Aaron of violence. In the midst of Aaron being scrutinized for murder, a man named Alexander Bradley came forward. Now, back in 2010, right as Aaron was poised to enter the NFL, he became friends with Alexander. The two often smoked pot together. Alexander was a known weed dealer. The friendship eventually soured, and according to Alexander, it grew violent. Alexander was now filing a civil suit against Aaron, alleging that he had shot him in the face, causing him to lose an eye. Yeah, you heard me right. He filed a suit alleging that Aaron had shot him in the face. The reason he said that Aaron shot him in the face was because he had supposedly made a comment about that drive-by shooting in which two men had been murdered and it had enraged Aaron. Meanwhile, more evidence was coming to light about that rental car in Odin's case. Around 30 minutes before Odin was killed, video footage at a local gas station shows him with Aaron in that car. Aaron might be on drugs in this footage, or at least something seems off. He dances in the parking lot, then goes inside the gas station to buy blue cotton candy bubble gum. Now, this is where the plot really thickens. During Odin's autopsy, it is revealed that there were not five, but six bullet wounds. That meant police needed to find a sixth shell casing. And find it they did. Enterprise rent-a-car employees had called police. When they cleaned out the rented car... They had thrown away a piece of paper with blue bubblegum wrapper inside of it. And once they fished that piece of blue bubblegum out of the dumpster, you know what was also in that blue bubblegum that Aaron had chewed? A sixth bullet shell. Before long, police had Aaron's two cronies from that night, Ernest Wallace and Carlos Ortiz, in their squad room. And after hours of interrogation, Ortiz began to cave. He hadn't seen exactly what happened, he said, but he saw Aaron, Ernest, and Odin leave the car. Only problem was, Odin didn't come back. He couldn't say for sure that Aaron was the shooter, he said, but he did tell police that when Aaron came back to the car, he was cradling a gun. Well, at that point, Police said, that's enough. 
Less than seven days after Odin Lloyd was discovered dead in the park, multiple squad cars and officers approached the Hernandez home. The street was lined with reporters who had been tipped off that a major development in the case was about to take place. And with that, Aaron Hernandez was arrested. That image of Aaron now lives in infamy. He was clad in red shorts and sneakers, handcuffed with his arms tucked inside his white t-shirt as cops led him out of his mansion. Police were now taking the boy who had grown up poor, but now lived in a glossy Boston suburb away. They were taking him away. They were taking him to jail. He would never reside in that mansion again. Not one more night. The dominoes in Aaron's life had now started to fall. Hours after his arrest, the Patriots put forth a statement making it known that they were releasing Aaron from the team. Within the span of a week, he went from being a football hero to a criminal charged with murder. This was not an open and shut case, far from it. Little did the world know, with everything that the police had put together, this was still just the tip of the iceberg. In our next episode... We'll go behind the scenes of Aaron's new life far away from the glory of football. As we go on, we'll explore new damning details that tie Aaron to this murder case. What was he texting Odin the night of his murder and why? Most of all, more of Aaron's secret past will be revealed. What else was he hiding and why? And believe me, There was plenty. That's what's next on The Fall of a Hero. From Football to Murder. The Aaron Hernandez Story. Mystery and Murder. Analysis by Dr. Phil. I'm Dr. Phil.